Okay, so thank you guys for joining cool. us today. Um, I'm Chloe, uh, I'm the operations manager of Lumi Fauci. So this workshop uh, is to help us to prepare for Voices for the Challenge 2021, if you haven't heard about it yet. Um, it's an online competition that we host yearly, and this year we're really focusing on biodiversity. And you can see all of our um, resources and something about our challenge on our website, which I'm also sending it through chat. So today, um, the topic is going to be filming, and we have Joseph Anthony with us, an award-winning uh, photographer, and he does a lot of amazing work in the wildlife, as well as, um, you know, filming volcanoes and animals. So you'll learn a lot more about that in a little bit. And we have uh, Dr. Ying Liu with us as well. She's the founder of Lumi Foche, and she'll be uh, introducing Joseph to us today. So thank you for joining, and then our workshop will start now. Thank you, Chloe. Well, welcome, Joseph. I am so delighted to be introducing you to our audience. Um, Joseph is a multiple award-winning British photographer, filmmaker, drone pilot, and photojournalist. Currently, he's actually in UK, but he goes between Hong Kong and UK. Uh, he's stuck there. We're hoping to get him back soon. <laughs> He specializes in uh, wildlife nature and conservation storytelling through images. He believes in taking a very mindful approach to his work, and he seeks to tell compelling stories with compassion and empathy, and to try to connect audiences with the wonders and beauty of the natural world. He hopes that this will encourage all of us to think more sustainably and to protect our planet and the resources while giving a voice to the voiceless. His work has been published globally on TV, print, online, and in exhibitions. Uh, clients have included the likes of National Geographic, WWF, and he featured in the 100-year anniversary of I Am Nikon camping with a film made about him on assignment with Nikon. He is well known for his work with big cats and his extensive coverage in film and photography of the historic 2018 Kilauea. Is that how you pronounce it? Kilauea. Kilauea, Kilauea volcano eruption in Hawaii. He teaches photography and produces bespoke design books and fine art prints. He can consult on a wide, wide variety of topics in photography and also film making. He is a voiceover artist, script writer, piano player, and financial markets trader. He is jack of all trades. <laughs> He's also a former long haul airline pilot and flying instructor. Wow. Welcome, <laughs> Joseph. You really, I've just now by introducing you, I've learned a lot more about you. Really looking forward to your talk. Okay, thanks for the kind introduction, Ying Ying. And uh, hi, Chloe. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, I don't need to talk anymore. That's it. You've done it. That's, that's it. You've covered everything I wanted to talk about. <laughs> so, no, no. Um, it's my absolute pleasure. Delightful, uh, delighted to be here. Thank you so much for uh, for, for you know hosting this challenge, um, and um, I'm really looking forward uh, to judging submissions. And uh, yes, it's uh, it's uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about my journey from photography uh, to videography. So um, without further ado, I'm going to share my screen in a second, and uh, we'll get started if that's okay. All right. Okay. Super. All right. So. Um, as Yin Ying uh, uh, said, I'm a British wildlife uh, photographer and filmmaker, uh, usually based in Hong Kong, currently talking to you from a wet and windy UK. There's been a storm here just recently, um, but I was actually born and raised in uh, West Africa. Um, and this is a pet tortoise we had, actually. It's an African spurred tortoise, and um, it was actually rescued uh, from the roadside, a uh, busy roadside by a family friend of ours. And uh, we had to take him in and look after him because um, 
while we we wanted to sort of look after him you know as a pet if you like uh over there unfortunately they they tend to want to eat them so this was from a very early age very young age this was my introduction to issues relating to poaching and the bushmeat trade unfortunately um now in the uh in the present day you know with climate change uh, that's uh, that's that's still a major issue and you know people normally associate poaching um with the collection of body parts like you know animal skins and rhino horn pangolin scales elephant tusks even tortoise shells right um but maybe not a lot of people appreciate that unfortunately in in less well-off countries um uh, they kind of need to poach wildlife for food and with crop failures due to climate change that's become an increasing problem so anyway, that's uh, that's sort of my early early years introduction to the to the to the uh, bushmeat trade and and uh, and wildlife even. But as Yin said, I haven't uh, always been a wildlife photographer and filmmaker. I uh, I've been a, an airline pilot. This is me inside the engine of a Boeing triple seven aircraft. I also flew the Boeing seven four seven four hundred jumbo and the Boeing seven five seven. And uh, alongside my photography and videography, I'm a, a professionally trained financial markets trader. And, um, and I've got to say, I'm not really interested in money, actually. Uh, to me, it's just a tool. It's just a number. And I use it to kind of help me um, have some sort of uh, freedom uh, of expression in my creative uh, career in photography and filmmaking. And so you might ask, well, what's that also got to do with, um, you know, uh, photography and videography? Well, actually flying, uh, my flying career and my trading career and my photography and videography career are actually all interconnected. Um, and uh, I've put here a list of all the different um, skills uh hang on, let me just remove this uh Sorry, that yeah, i think you know, but, uh, do you guys have a question constantine and you i saw you raise your hand no okay all right <laughs> i continue yes thank you okay so here's a list of uh, skills that i've identified that kind of are all interconnected uh i'm going to talk about risk versus uh, reward uh in a bit um I think problem solving there on line three is pretty important. Um, the other thing is they're all skill based, right? So practice makes perfect and you need to develop what I call a, a muscle memory. Um, so it's very useful in, in nature photography and, and, and uh, you know, filmmaking uh, to kind of know, know your way around a camera because um, sometimes you need to operate it in the dark or in you know, adverse weather conditions um, and you sometimes need to be just focusing on your subject. So in that sort of situation, you kind of want to be able to be able to, you know, move your, move your hands around the camera and know where all the buttons are um, instinctively sometimes without even looking at them. And basically all of those uh, skills, when I put them all together, uh, they give me what, what I call a framework of operation and understanding, uh, which allows me to produce uh, consistent images. I'm uh, obsessed with uh, the golden ratio uh, and the Fibonacci sequence, and I use it in my photography and videography, um, as well as my trading. And it's a number sequence uh, uh, that was discovered by the Italian mathematician Leonardo Fibonacci. And the really cool thing is Fibonacci and the golden ratio appears everywhere in nature, which I find an endless source of fascination. And this is how I apply it in my uh, trading in a linear fashion. And uh, so this image I took, um, it's uh, basically ice, icebergs on the surface of the ocean revealing the ocean currents, which you wouldn't normally see. And it reminded me of the Fibonacci uh, swirl. And then if I also overlay uh, a Fibonacci uh, 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 overlay like that, you can see how, that, uh, how, the, how the composition uh, is decided on. So that's how I kind of use it sometimes in, uh, in composition. And of course, it was uh, you know having that privileged view, looking uh, looking down on the planet um, from from the aerial perspective, flying around the world. You know, I, I saw, you know, I saw a beautiful planet. You know, vast wildernesses waiting to be explored. I didn't see borders. I didn't see conflicts. Um, I, you know, I just saw this one amazing ecosystem. But also, I did see pollution. I did see things that concern me, like uh, overfishing, for example, which was a which is still a big problem today. Um, but one day, I'll never forget this, I was flying between Hong Kong and, uh, and New York and we were going via the North Pole. And it was a time of year when, you know, the polar ice cap should be completely frozen over. And we were within about, what, 80, 80 miles of the true North Pole. And I remember looking down and I could see big cracks in the, in the ice pack and you could see down through to the Arctic Ocean. I thought, well, that can't be right. You know, this is supposed to be totally frozen over. And it was kind of at that point I decided that I, you know, to think about what I was doing 
think about living more sustainably, more modestly, um, and monitoring things like my carbon footprint and stuff like that. And then in 2008, I got into uh, wildlife photography thanks to um, a mesmerizing leopard sighting. First time I'd ever seen a leopard in the wild on a safari in uh, South Africa. And I decided right there and then that I wanted to be a wildlife photographer thanks to that. Um, but at the time, uh, I just got into digital photography and uh, done a little bit of a bit of film photography, but I wasn't particularly competent in wildlife photography. So I decided I'd go away and uh, learn as much as I could uh, about photography and then uh, come back when I was better um, and see if I could uh, make better images of these amazing creatures in the wild that sort of totally captivated me. So that's what I did between 2008 and 2013, over a five year period. I really sort of, in all my spare time, I, uh, I learned everything I could about photography. Uh, I didn't just learn about wildlife photography, I learned about uh, landscape photography and cityscape photography and sports photography and all different genres. And all of these, uh, studying all of these genres helped me really round my skills and it came in useful uh, later on in my career. Um, and yeah, so by the end of, uh, and I did workshops, I did uh, self-study, I did formal training, um, you know, all kinds of things, field trips, you name it, I did it. Uh, in 2013, um, I got to the point where I thought, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm ready now to get back to photographing what I loved, which was when I wanted to photograph more leopards and wildlife. Um, so I came up with this idea to develop a creative vision. Uh, and the idea was to, to, to go back to, uh, to, to, to the wilderness and, and try and create an image that would convey to me the essence of a leopard because um, I was so mesmerized by that first leopard sighting. I thought I really want to try and get an image that does justice to those amazingly beautiful creatures. Um, so I put a plan together and I decided over a three month period that I would, uh, that I'd find some leopard hotspots uh, around the world and um, set up a project so that I could, I could go and photograph them in different locations and also try and do it as exclusively as possible, um, get myself some expert guiding one-on-one uh, -on -one, um, own use of a vehicle, all these things to allow me creative freedom and also to have time with the experts so I could learn as much as I can about wildlife and big cats in particular. And then also wanted to create a portfolio of, of work. So it wasn't just about leopards. I wanted to create sort of a, a wildlife portfolio because I wanted to start um, selling my work commercially. Uh, but the real focus was on, was on leopards. And I saw all kinds of amazing behaviors by leopards. Uh, and other wildlife. Uh, this was uh, this was a failed hunt by by a leopard that had been st uh, stalking and staking out uh, some wildebeest. And um, here he is again, kind of uh, you know doing classic cat things. Um, and this was a pre-visualized uh, shot. Um, so I had the framing in mind. So the composition there without the leopard in, as you can see, um, I, I thought was kind of you know very very nicely framed. Um, but the leopard wasn't in it. So I thought, well, okay, I knew the leopard was off to the right of the shot. Uh, off to this side here and um, knowing what big cats do is it, there was this mound on the left there of the image you can see over here and I decided that I just wait for him to see if he would walk up into it and and, and hopefully give me some kind of photograph and and thankfully this pre-visualized shot came out better than I could have imagined because he stopped halfway up the hill and looked at the camera which was like you know just a gift I also like repeating patterns as I said I, I shot uh, photographed other wildlife um, so repeating patterns is something I always look for in my photography. And uh, here I found uh, two giraffes um, mirroring the shape of a tree in the foreground. And then taking that idea further, I, um, I've got this uh, leopard shot went sort of black and white route. Um, you see this blade of grass here is kind of mirroring the shape of the head and the body. And then developing the idea further, you know, the more I photographed these leopards and the more I saw them in the wild, I started to get a feel for, you know, what their behavior was like, what their personality was like. and um, and so here I decided to use creative lighting. And uh, you know, got to remember, you're, you're a photographer, you're a filmmaker, and your creative vision, you've got to direct. So here I was directing the driver to position the vehicle in a certain way, and I was getting the tracker who's on the front of the vehicle, who had a, a handheld spotlight, to direct the, uh, the spotlight in a certain way so that I could get this shot the way I wanted it. And then developing the idea further again, this is a similar, similar idea using foreground uh, and background and the leopard in between and the different way creative lighting from the side. So as time went on, on this project, over three months, you know, I had a decent amount of time to really think about the shot I wanted. And I finally decided, you know, after taking lots of photos and getting, uh, you know, lots of, you know, reasonably, reasonably good quality uh, photos and variety as well of behavior, not just of leopards, but of other animals as well. Um, I decided the shot I needed had to be at night. 
uh, and it had to involve a bit of movement because nighttime movement shots there weren't really any around at the time because it's for a good reason it's quite a difficult and risky shot to, to take and easy to get wrong but uh, this brings me on to the point about risk versus reward and uh, when you're when you're doing photography or filmmaking it's very important uh, to have this framework in mind um, you should always think about trying to bank your safe shots first right so and then take your risks later because the last thing you want to do is to is to go in for the risky shots first that have a higher chance of failure and then you run out of time and you end up with uh, with nothing at all uh, so it's always best to go into a project or an assignment um, even if there's time pressure um, and definitely if you've got more time you should all and uh, I can I can say that this this image kind of put me on the map as a wildlife photographer um, this was definitely the essence of a leopard photo that I kind of been dreaming about um, and yeah it is a high-risk shot and, uh, and it's quite very difficult to capture actually um, just like this but, um, but but I got it and it was actually towards the end of the three-month project um, and most important for me wasn't how successful it was because it did you know win a lot of awards and was published all over the world and in exhibitions but for me, it was, it sort of gave me the confidence to move forward with my career because I kind of felt that I'd had a creative vision. I thought about how I wanted to execute it. I planned it and then, uh, you know, then saw it through um, to get the final image I was looking for. And here are some other examples of risk versus reward. I've done some professional sports photography and uh, similar idea really. If you look at the top two pictures, I mean, one's from the Rugby Sevens in Hong Kong um, the top right one is uh, from the London 2012 Olympics and you can see I'd call those top two shots uh, safe shots they're not necessarily easy to get but they're easier than the bottom shot that third one there um, so if I was to say out of 10 um, shots you probably get seven out of ten shots like the top two photos that are usable uh, and good quality um, but when you're trying to take shot number three at the bottom there um, that's maybe one in ten or you know like one in a hundred or one in 50. so as you can imagine if you go if you go out and just try and get that one shot first and then you run out of time you might not get it you might not get anything um, so bank your safe shots assess your risk versus your reward and that's how to kind of proceed so i hope that helps you think think more carefully about uh, how you approach your shoots and uh, once you learn to tell a story in one photo then uh, you know you can start to tell a story in a series of photos once you get good at doing that it'll become much easier for you to craft stories and make storyboards for your filmmaking. So my first introduction to filmmaking was both in front of and behind the camera. So in 2016, we are now, um, I'd already been selling my work and uh, doing commercial uh, photography for uh, a few years. And um, I had this body of work from, you know, like for example, that wildlife project that I just spoke about. And I started to post photos on Instagram. Uh, and it was part of it. it was a bet actually with uh, two photographer friends of mine to see who could get sort of the most followers just for fun but also just to see how we could interact with Instagram and by posting my photos on Instagram Nikon discovered me so um, they'd seen my work and they reached out uh, and they said they were interested in my wildlife photography and uh, they asked me what equipment I used and I was all Nikon by then I had all Nikon cameras and all Nikon lenses which obviously they were pleased about and uh, and uh, so we got a sort of a developing relationship and they um, they featured my work a few times um, and then um, one day um, they called me up and said uh, would I be interested in going on an assignment at short notice to Sri Lanka um, they had just released a new lens um, a new version of a lens that I already had actually but they were releasing a new version of it and they wanted me to go and test it for them <clears throat> on the photographic assignment and come back with about 11 images um, for, for commercial use as part of a campaign to promote this new lens and to prove that I could shoot uh, one assignment using only one lens. Um, so that was the, that was the kind of rule was uh, I could only use that, that one lens for the assignment. Um, and, uh, and then he said, oh, and by the way, when you, uh, when you get there, there's gonna be a film crew following you around and they're gonna make a film about you doing it. And I was like, oh, okay, that's interesting. Never done that before. Um, now I can't show you the film on this particular um, workshop, but you can see it on my uh, website um, and also that link at the bottom there, the Nicole photographer's Joseph Anthony link at the bottom of that picture. Um, I think Chloe's going to put it in the uh, in the chat box along with my 
website address. Um, and that one will take you to a, a site where you can see a few of the, the images that were captured on that assignment with some behind the scenes story. Um, and then if you go to my website homepage, um, you'll be able to, um, to see the, the film on the, on the homepage there. So Chloe, could you, um, could you put that in the chat box, please? Yeah, that's in the chat box. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Let me just minimize this again. Right, checking they're still there. So really in a situation like that, it was very short notice actually. I only had like three days uh, or so to like figure out what I was gonna do. Uh, and so no time to plan really. Um, to come up with a few ideas and some sort of you know research on on things I could photograph in Sri Lanka and where, but basically in a situation that you just say yes and then you figure out the rest later, and that's quite often what happens in these situations. Um, and uh, so there you can see these are some behind the scenes photos from the uh, from the uh, production. Um, as I say, a film crew met me out there, and um, they had to actually film it on a Nikon camera. So you know that like sort of one of these. Um, which was interesting for me because uh, I never thought of filmmaking using digital cameras, I always thought of cinema cameras. Um, but by then, uh, the technology had advanced enough that uh, that uh, the, the, the video quality was actually very good in the digital cameras, even then in 2016. Um, and so that got me thinking, you know, maybe, you know, I could do video as well. And by being in front of the camera uh, and also a bit behind the camera, I was able to see the, how the director worked, how the camera operator worked, the producer, the ground fixers, the script writer. I was involved in the script writing actually, so I co-scripted. Um, and then I also um, got involved in the voiceover narration. So, so, so those were things that I've not done before, um, but they came in very useful uh, later on uh, in my career. So um, why should we be shooting video instead of uh, photos? I mean, there's nothing wrong with photos. Um, you know, they're still very much in demand. Good quality photos very much in demand. But here are some statistics that will make you think. Um, 81% of businesses are now using video as a marketing tool, which is up about 20% from last year. And viewers are retaining 95% of a message when they watch it in a video compared to 10% when reading it in text. So video has become the number one way that today's uh, brands are communicating with their audiences and demand for video has never been greater than it is today. So to narrow this down into a wildlife filmmaking, so research that has been done in that industry um, has given the following insights. And these are things that I've actually um, picked up myself from focus groups that I've been involved in with, uh, with uh, wildlife and nature TV production companies actually. So um, this has come directly from, from some of those meetings. Um, so the, the, the feedback is that audiences love animal behavior they can relate to or that they find funny. Uh, they like uh, to see character or personality uh, without anthropomorphizing them by what that means is um, without assigning them human characteristics so it's very important when you're photographing or filming wildlife to uh, to treat them as individual species with their own behavior and their own personality and it's and it's those traits that you want to kind of uh, reveal and show off uh, rather than try and make them human like that's what anthropomorph not anthropomorphizing them means and then audience really like it when you find something that might surprise them or that they might not know. Now I'm going to uh, show you some photos and, and video clips from outtakes uh, from assignments I've done with elephants um, that will hopefully uh, provoke some thoughts and they might surprise you. This only surprised me when I saw them. Okay, first of all, a photo. So this is a huge uh, bull elephant. It's, really, it's the tallest, I think the biggest elephant I've ever seen anywhere in the world. Uh, this was in uh, South Africa. And, um, and the, the funny thing was that he was actually afraid of that little mongoose that you can see down here in the corner. He was flapping his ears, he was leaning over, he was agitated. Um, yeah, he was actually afraid. So that, so that uh, fable, they say, uh, that elephants are afraid of mice, I think is, uh, is true. Okay, here's another funny situation, although it was a bit scary at the time for the, uh, for the film crew in the vehicle. This was in Sri Lanka during my Nikon assignment and we had two safari vehicles. Uh, we went, on, uh, we went on, a, on, a, on a safari section of the assignment and, um, and uh, he actually looked like he was charging the vehicles. He actually charged our vehicle first and then moved on to this vehicle behind. Now I briefed the crew early morning about all the things that could happen out in, in the wild. 
Um, and this was kind of one of them that I briefed. I never expected the elephant to stick his head right into a vehicle. Um, now, some of them had never been on safari before. So as you can imagine, this was like for their first safari to see this happen. It was like mind blowing. Um, and uh, yeah, they weren't really sure quite what to do about it. But it turned out, unfortunately, what it was was this elephant, um, even though he's wild, they, they'd been feeding him. Um, tourists had been feeding him. So he'd gotten used to associating vehicles with food. So that's what he'd done. He'd just gone over to the vehicle to find some food. And of course, when they realized this in, in, the, in the Jeep, they started to throw all the, the, the food out of the, out of the window to see if they get him to go away. So that was pretty surprising behavior. Okay, next, I think, uh, okay, so elephants are known to like uh, walk around in huge herds um, and walk for miles in sort of long trains like this photo. And I, this was, this is only, it's like 20 or 21 elephants here of all different sizes and ages. Um, trains. Okay, so we were uh, thinking, okay, we'll try and we'll try and get ahead and cut them off, uh, you know, say cut them off, you know, try and get ahead to, to the front of the train and see if we could get some footage there uh, as they cross one of the roads. So that's what we did. And um, then something really quite amazing happened when we got to the front of the queue, which is coming up in the next slide. A little video clip. So that's the <laughs> matriarch. <clears throat> so the matriarch usually uh, is at the, at the front and she leads the group, uh, leads the herd. And, uh, and blow me down, it looked like she actually marked a line in the dirt as if to say to, to her herd, this is the way to go. And I don't know for sure that's what she's doing, but I mean, to me, that was pretty uh, intelligent behavior uh, and certainly quite surprising. And then the next uh, is a video clip to watch. Okay, so that's that one really surprised me. I've seen a lot of behaviors, but that was that one showed real intelligence and real sentience. Uh, that big bull elephant, um, he basically measured up that stick he found on the road and uh, then picked it up after carefully measuring it, scratched his eyelash um, and then placed it gently down. And it actually looked like he was trying to balance it on its end. Like he was playing with it to see if he could balance it. And he tried and it just fell over at the end. And to me, that was absolutely incredible. Here's another clip. Oops. Okay, so um, the ranger I was with, uh, when I captured that, he, he didn't know I captured him. I said, oh, I got it, I got it. And, uh, and he said, you know, that's, he goes, he said, I think that's the top five things I've ever seen in uh, any wildlife, in any wildlife encounter. Like, it was so unusual to see this big elephant you think is so sure-footed um, actually tripping over. And he was fine afterwards, but uh, it was really quite interesting, you know, slightly comical moment once we, uh, at the time, but, you know, once we made sure that he was okay. And then um, the next one uh, is about a bit of a surprise. So you can surprise audiences with a reveal like that. And um, uh, that's unusual. You know, ba baby elephants are quite often hidden um, by the, the rest of the family. They're very protective of their young. So um, to have even a, a fleeting moment like that where they, you know, they separate and, and you see, see the youngster, the baby, um, is, a, is a sort of pleasant surprise. So another thing about audiences, they, they like to be gripped. So anything you can do to create and evoke a strong emotional response will be successful. Um, and I come back to this photo um, because actually it was quite a long time it took me for it to, 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 to see an audience reaction to this image. And it done very well <clears throat> in various ways. But I remember I was at one awards ceremony and, um, and they, they brought up this image on a big projector screen. And uh, as soon as they did that, the audience gasped. And, um, and that was the first time I kind of really understood how 
an image or a moving image um, can, can, can really work and grab the attention of, uh, of an audience and evoke a strong emotional reaction uh, if you get the image right. So uh, for the Lumivoce Voices for the Planet Challenge, I'd like you to think about the following if you're going to enter. And, uh, you know, I do this all the time when I think about what am I doing with my camera and what, you know, what am I doing with my photo photography and what am I doing with my films? I'm always asking myself, why and what am I communicating? And why am I doing this? You know, what is my objective? Who am I trying to reach? So who is my target audience? And what do I want them to do, if anything? You know, what's my desired outcome? What is the call to action? And then keep in mind the Lumi Boche message, which is protect what we love. So if we can see that come through in your submissions, that'll be great. So how are we going to do this in uh, filmmaking? So I'm going to give you a framework here that's been used by Hollywood directors the world over, nature documentary filmmakers, you name it. Um, it's called the three act storytelling structure. And, um, and actually it's broken down into eight sequences as well, but uh, we've only got time today to talk about the three act storytelling structure. So if you use this, um, framework, it'll really help you with uh, your uh, filmmaking and, and make them consistent throughout. So what is a three act structure? It's more than just a beginning, a middle and an end. So um, it's broken up into three acts. And in the beginning, we have what's called the, the setup or the introduction. So here you're setting the scene, um, usually with a, an environment shot um, of your animal in their normal world, as we call it, and everything's sort of fine and dandy and happy. Um, then you move in from the setup, you're gonna take them from act one into act two, which is um, where you take them out of their normal world and you're putting them into a, uh, a situation of some kind of jeopardy or challenge or confrontation. And uh, it's here that the stakes get higher, the action rises and it builds up to a crisis point as you move into act three, where something happens and then there's a resolution of some sort and then the action falls away and your hero may or may not end up back in the normal world. So that's why this is also referred to as a story arc. You'll hear the term story arc used and that's why, because it involves sort of a rising uh, a crescendo and then a, a, a falling uh, action. So this is what I recommend that you should use for your um, storytelling structures uh, for all your, um, your uh, video moving forwards. And then within that, you know, uh, image making is not just about your composition. Everyone talks about composition and point of view. So it's not just about getting low or getting high or overhead if you have a drone. Um, there's something in video we have to think about called shot sizes. And here's a matrix to give you an idea of what I mean about shot sizes. And usually, usually uh, your act one will, will have the, the, the extra wide and the, or the wide as your opening shots because it's setting the scene, right? You're gonna start in a, a wider environment and then you're gonna sort of zoom in on your on your hero subject. And then after that, you know, it depends on, you know, what you're trying to create. Um, you can have any of these other different kind of shot sizes. Um, they all have different uh, effects and impact. Um, cowboy shot's quite an interesting one because it's a bit like a, a medium, between a medium and a full shot, um, but the angle's slightly lower and it gives your hero a little bit more impact and sort of power. The others, I think, are, are pretty self-explanatory. So I'm going to relate to uh, use one of my films as a case study um, to sort of uh, give you an idea of the application of the three-act storytelling structure. Um, so in 2019, um, I was uh, in a discussion with WWF uh, Hong Kong, and um, they basically said they needed to make a, 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 a TV commercial for Hong Kong TV. Um, about elephants and the uh, campaign was to try and deter the demand uh, for ivory. So um, I, I said, yeah, I can do that. And they gave me a budget. I said, well, yeah, I think I can do it for that too. So I just said yes. And a bit like the Nikon assignment, I just said yes and I figured out, figured out the rest later. Um, so I decided to go to South Africa. And, uh, and so I started planning that uh, on a relatively low budget. So I was a uh, self-shooting PD, which means a producer director. And uh, there's lots of things to consider as a self-shooter. Um, and uh, uh, they're still working with, with, it, with teams. So I, had a, uh, I hired a music composer to help me with the music, um, to compose something original that would go with the, the narrative and help with the story arc of the, of the film. Um, 
and a, a brilliant uh, composer, uh, Karen Chalmers in the UK, um, um, composed the music uh, for the film. Um, and I worked with her remotely. So she was in the UK and I was actually in Africa. Uh, we had to work uh, on music together, um, sort of like that. Uh, and then for the final post-production, I uh, had to work with a, a, a post-production team in Hong Kong. Um, but otherwise the rest was, was up to me really. Um, so you have to organize all the permissions and access for video, you need permissions and access for everything. Um, so if you can get exclusive access wherever possible for freedom of movement, that's always great. Um, I'm responsible for budgeting and negotiation, very important, try and get the most bang for your buck, as they say. Um, and then, um, you know, location scouting, finding expert guides uh, that are suitable for the project you've got in mind. Um, location fix would normally be somebody you'd recruit, but because I had enough experience um, in Africa, uh, I kind of was my own location fixer. Um, model, releases, model releases is an interesting one. Um, if you're going to have any people in your videos, um, you normally need their consent. And this is done through model release and it can either be done on a written piece of paper where they sign it to say they're releasing their image to be used in a video. Um, but nowadays you can also get it as an, as an iPhone app. That is an app called Easy Release. Uh, so you can easily get them to sign it digitally. Uh, and then risk assessment. I'd like to risk reward, but it's also just pure risk assessment, you know, um, identifying uh, what safety issues there might be. And um, it's very important actually in this day and age, risk assessments are very important in, uh, in foreign film shoots, especially, but any film shoot. Um, and so safety is paramount. I was going to Africa, even though I knew, I knew it well, um, you know, your personal safety is very important, especially with a lot of expensive camera equipment. Um, and also the safety of your data. It's very important to back up your data. I'll remind you of that later on. So for the 60 second commercial, which is what they wanted and a 30 second version as well, but it was 60 seconds. I've got to tell a story in 60 seconds. Um, it was six weeks of filming um, in Africa and uh, in South Africa, actually. Um, and I was there for a total of eight weeks and that included the uh, offline editing. Um, so that, that means basically the, the full edit of the film that gets locked in, and then you take that back to Hong Kong and then it goes online. And once you go into the online phase, you can't change anything. So up to the, up to the end of the offline phase, you can keep making changes. But once you lock it in, you're into the online phase. And then it's just doing like the sound mixing and the, and the finer color grading, uh, any, uh, sorry, color grading, any, uh, any special effects, um, graphics, and then final broadcast TV preparation. And then I, I covered a lot of ground. I was uh, 2000 miles, I think, traveled by road and that wasn't including um, the time spent on safari. Wow, that's like amazing. I mean, for only for 60 seconds. Because it was all original footage uh, needed. Oh. That's kind of why. You know, if there was, if there was, if there was some stuff we already, in fact, part of the film did use some archive footage, but um, but that was a last minute uh, decision. Um, that wasn't the original plan, so I had to adapt to that, um, fit that in. Um, but uh, but yes, um, when you're trying to tell a story that's kind of uh, to show personality of the animals, um, yeah, you kind of need that amount of time. Um, and here, I've been breaking it down further, you know, uh, I spend more time in this vehicle than in my bed. So during six weeks, I was literally in that vehicle 15, 16 hours per day, every day in the bush for six weeks, only took a few days off. Um, and the reason is you, you need the time, you know, you need the quality time with wild animals, um, especially trying to find particular behaviors. Um, they don't always present them to you. We're not always in the right, you can't always get in the right position. Uh, to get the shots you need. So you really have to really have to, to grind it away. And, you know, sometimes you get lucky and you can get it, but it, you know, in reality, you don't, um, and you need, you need the time. And also you need time to get to know the subject. Um, so I actually found, so one of the ways to kind of improve my chances was I found one location where they had a, a reasonable sized herd with good dynamics, you know, matriarchs and bulls, some babies, adolescents, and the matriarch was a very strong one. So the herd was a strong herd and um, you know, this kind of, this kind of helped. So I kind of thought, well, I'll try and focus as much as time as I can with this particular herd so that you get to know them and they get to know you as well. So the more time you spend with them and they get to, to know you and smell you because they have a very good sense of smell. So they, they kind of get used to you. Um, then they, you know, even they relax even more and you see more of their natural behavior because with youngsters around, they're very protective. Um, so they can be a bit skittish. Um, but you know, you know, things are, 
you know things are changing you know when you've got babies like uh, moving on to the next slide actually um you know it's very hard to photograph and fill them because they're always hidden away first of all they're tiny and then they're hidden away under these other you know other adults and sub adults um and they very rarely reveal the babies and if uh, you know if one day comes when when they do actually uh, present a youngster to you it literally is like presenting them then you know you've won their trust actually it's a, it's a really special moment when the herd of elephants do that because most of the time they're hiding it away so the first time they might reveal the, reveal the baby to you is like you know that's it they trust you that's a good yeah so um and one of the other things that makes it hard with elephants and believe it or not you think oh they're big animals you know they're easy to find you know they <laughs> it's not a problem but actually sometimes it is you know sometimes we'd be with the herd and then i might only go away for like three or four hours sleep maximum because um, i'd get in late i'd have to offload the data from my camera back it up because you want to make sure you do it or we can't afford to, to leave your data you know without a backup so it didn't matter what time of day it was or how how tired i was always back up your data when i get back in and then uh, when i'm going out again maybe three or four hours later before sunrise you know before sunrise until after sunset and um you'd think the elephants couldn't have gone very far in that time but oh boy there were some days we just lost them for like two three days and didn't see an elephant and just like how could this how could this happen and it's because they can move um, pretty fast. This is some uh, aerial footage I got with a drone. I got special permission to um, to find them using the drone because we'd lost them. So we thought, well, let's just put a drone up in the air and see if we can find them that way. And eventually we did. And we, we began to understand, you know, how you can lose them. They can move pretty fast if they want to. I hope you can see that. You can see the see the herd there, kind of running. And then even, you know, even with all of that time, sometimes I just couldn't get shots that I needed. And, and here I had to go into a semi, semi captive environment um, to get a particular close up shot um, of an elephant eye, which I needed for the story. And, um, and so these, uh, uh, this place in South Africa um, has this big open expanse where three um, rescue elephants uh, lived. Um, and this matriarch was, as you can see, kept trying to play with my uh, Play with my camera here so i've got a camera on a gimbal there to stabilize it because actually this is a really hard shot to get it took me three attempts to get the shot i wanted that i had in mind um that's how tricky it was but i, I got it in the end um <laughs> thankfully but i had to persevere this is a pretty pretty cool experience to be uh, up close with the elephants like that okay so now what i'm going to do is i'm going to play the film and then uh it's only 60 seconds and uh, at the end, I'm just going to kind of refer back to the uh, storytelling structure to just kind of relate it back to that. The majestic elephant, nature's gentle giants, roam the earth, raising families and protecting each other. Like you, they feel deep emotions, but they are disappearing from the wild because this is what we are doing to them. Around 20,000 African elephants are killed every year for their ivory. That's around 55 every day. And the effects are devastating to elephants and the ecosystems that depend on them. We're committed to protecting elephants. And if you feel the same as we do, please support us by donating as little as $50 a month to help us combat poaching and the illegal wildlife trade. In appreciation for your support, we'll send you a gift pack and regular updates about our vital work with elephants. Please visit www.elephant.com.hk. Together, we can protect them. Okay, here we go. So, how does that relate to the three act storytelling structure? Well, I'm going to take you through it. So, these are some stills from the video. Um, now, I'm just going to start by saying that uh, normally uh, you'd actually probably start with this as your opening shot because um, it's the environment shot, it's a wider angle. Um, but because this was a TV commercial and because of the way the narrative was, uh, was written, um, I decided to flip these two around and put this kind of cross between a full shot and a cowboy shot as the first shot um, to have immediate impact so that you know, you're trying to grab the attention of the audience on TV as quick as possible and make sure they absolutely know that this is a, a film about elephants. So because it was 60 second storytelling, uh, it's really not a lot of time um, to get the message across. I decided to flip these two around, but, but normally it would actually be this one kind of first and then maybe this one or some kind of intermediate shot. 
okay but also notice it's bright and kind of warm looking okay so this is elephants in their normal world right so this is still act one and then this is still act one so we're developing the narrative some more we're talking about you know elephants and families and how they they have deep emotions and showing tenderness um so that sets the scene okay for act one and then you're taking them out of their normal world into act two and if you notice if i go back one here it's still warm right and kind of cozy and nice and happy and here now i'm shifting gears we're going into more dark and foreboding notice it's kind of bluer color um, almost like sort of dusk and night um, it's kind of a, a portent for things to come you know something sinister is about to happen and again i you know i move straight into um sort of you know the the less nice part of the film if you like you know the more shocking part um, but again we kind of have to make impact with this film you know we have to leave the audience under no uh, illusion what happens to elephants when they're poached for their ivory you know a lot of people don't seem to realize that they have to be killed because some people believe it or not think basically have to kill the elephant to get the ivory and a lot of people don't seem to realize that so the gore shot, I'm not going to show it again. Um, but then, you know, after that, get to this shot, which is kind of like the crescendo. This is the peak of the kind of crisis action. This is kind of between act two and act three. Um, and it's the sad elephant. This was the close up shot that I said was really hard for me to get. Um, now I did have a natural tear, um, which is what I wanted. I wanted to get a natural tear, but uh, because I had to shoot it in slow motion, it doesn't flow um, very fast. So we had to animate it. So we kind of cheated a little bit, but it, well, we did follow the track of the original team. We just enhanced it a little bit in post-production so, um, so that you could see it in real time, if you see what I mean. And then if you notice, we're kind of a cross between sort of dark in the background, moody still in the background, and kind of a ray of sunlight in the foreground. So this kind of shows you that dividing line between, you know, going from the dark and foreboding into the kind of the hope phase where we take them out of Act 2 and into Act 3. And then you see we go back to kind of warm colors and playful and uh, you know elephants together sort of happy and harmoniously and really by this point in the film um we've we've actually sort of kind of finished the story in a way because uh, that's after about 30 something seconds so actually i've told the story pretty much in 30 seconds um and then because of other requirements of the commercial um we had to just put some other clips in to kind of build up to a kind of more hopeful hopeful ending and and try to encourage and promote a, a call to action so that's, uh, that's a very quick summary of how I applied the three-act storytelling structure to my film. And uh, hopefully that'll help you with uh, you when you make your films. Now, um, you know, I was storytelling in one minute, okay, which is quite a challenge. Um, but, uh, but a top tip for you with your submissions, um, if your footage can tell a story without any music or narration, so if you, just, if you can make your film and, uh, and somebody can look at it and without any prompting can kind of tell what the story is, then you're on the right track. Because then when you add music, and when you add voiceover, hopefully that'll enhance it even more. Um, and then we're giving some guidance for the, for the uh, Voices for the Planet Challenge. And that is that the film duration um, for your films would be between uh, two to five minutes fit to uh, Lumi Watch your Music. That's right, isn't it, uh, Chloe? Yep, yeah, that's correct. <laughs> okay, good, cool. All right, now I'm gonna change, change tack completely. I'm gonna take you from elephants to volcanoes. And the importance of empathy and ethic, ethics, and you're going to wonder, well, why, why am I talking about that? Because when you when you think of volcanoes, you probably think of scenes like this, you know, spectacular natural fireworks, and they are indeed spectacular spectacular events. Um, but uh, but my story with volcanoes kind of goes back to 2017. Um, now, it's one of the things I did. I, I would monitor. I was always wanted fascinated by volcanoes. Never managed to go and uh, and photograph them. Um, but I followed one in particular, which was the Kilauea volcano in Hawaii. And uh, every day and every week, the Hawaii Volcano Observatory uh, publishes um, um, email updates about the activity going on. And I remember in sort of September, I think it was 2017, I, I saw something kind of change in the, in the information that was in the report. There was increased activity that hadn't been there for quite a while. Um, it is the most active volcano in the world. Um, but relatively speaking, it had been quietly active. Um, and then suddenly things cha changed. So I thought, you know, maybe this is my chance. So I had a window of opportunity to go out there and I decided I'd go and just see 
you know what what I could find, and it was a and it was a good decision because uh, one of the things I saw was this incredible fire hose, as they call it, event. Um, so this is uh, this is very uh, unusual. Uh, doesn't happen very often there, and it's where a lava tube uh, coming from under the under the ground comes out of the side of the cliff and it pours down uh, into the ocean. And in this case, with this picture on the left here, it actually poured down and built its own cone, huge cone, and then it flowed down into the uh, into the ocean. Now we talk about risk and reward a lot. I mean, these two guys here, I think, is one risk too far. I certainly wouldn't have been up there. Um, that's pretty dangerous. Uh, that cliff would be very unstable. As you can already see here, this was this was previously where the cliff was, and it collapsed into the ocean. So this could collapse at any at any time. So for me, it was already kind of risky enough. You know, if you go on a boat, I was on a boat here uh, at sunrise um, to catch this fire hose, and you, know, you can get something called literal explosions, where, where the lava goes into the ocean and then it explodes out of the ocean because it reacts with the seawater. Um, so that's that's already a risk enough, uh, and some boats have been known to get damaged uh, from that. Um, but nothing like that happened on on, uh, on this trip for me. Um, but I got uh, I got this photo. Um, and this was a National Geographic photo of the day. And, um, and then it was uh, awarded uh, and, and put in an exhibition in London in uh, May 2018. So I went back to, I, was, I went to the UK and I was invited to go to the exhibition and see it in the exhibition. And um, it was amazing because I, I just got there and that very week um, it was the huge eruption and a well, huge earthquake and then eruption that started uh, in Hawaii, uh, which became the biggest eruption in uh, 200 years. And uh, as I said, I was in London. I had most of my camera equipment with me by chance, not all of it. I decided, you know what? I've just got to hot foot it, pun intended, hot foot it over there. Um, so I, I made an arrangement actually. Uh, there was a news agency that I'd uh, had a, a, a relationship with through my photojournalism um, over the years. And I sort of contacted them and said, hey, why don't we you know, set up a contract? I'll give you, you know, some exclusivity. And, uh, and so I can go out there and, uh, you know, and go as media, basically, so, and, and photograph what's going on. No guarantee, you know, what's going to happen. You know, nobody really knew it at that point. It was very, very early on. Um, but uh, so I did. I just I went over there as quick as I could with the equipment that I had. And um, 100, you know, I ended up there for two, two months during the eruption and three months, uh, sorry, and a third month uh, in the aftermath of the eruption and um yeah it was epic i mean i can't describe uh, the experience uh, really uh, it's, it's a talk of its own i could do a whole talk just on just on the volcano uh, stories i'm going to share a few with them uh, in this talk um but uh, lots of my images were published around the world um, still are being published today they keep selling keep selling even today um and uh, here's a couple that were published by national geographic in print uh, and this was this image was chosen by National Geographic as the top 100 photos of 2018 out of about 2 million photos that they had uh, submitted to their editors. Um, and it was, uh, it was uh, made as their uh, storytelling feature cover image. So that, uh, that gentleman there, um, he's taking, a, we're sitting in his garden actually, and he's on a garden chair um, and he's looking down at his property, um, which is being consumed by lava down at the bottom there. Unfortunately, he's on farmland, and that's some of his farmland uh, down here that's basically being destroyed by lava. And the full moon was rising, and he decided, you know, in numb resignation to, to live stream it um, to his Facebook uh, friends um, as the full moon rose. Um, so it was a kind of bittersweet uh, moment to capture. Um, but I was able to um, actually stay in his house. So um, as luck would have it, um, I chanced upon this opportunity and he basically wanted to evacuate and he said, okay, myself and two other photojournalists could stay in this house and look after it for him, assuming it didn't get consumed by lava. And this was the view actually from, from the living room uh, window. Uh, so that's how close we were to uh, some of the most violent activity. And there were earthquakes all the time because after the big earthquake, there were huge aftershocks. So the house was shaking all the time. Um, the explosion, explosions were like bombs going off, uh, jet engines roaring, uh, uh, it's like a natural war zone, literally. So we didn't sleep. I was there for, say, the first three weeks. I was there out of the two months. I was living in this house and um, didn't get any sleep, which is out shooting uh, all the action every day, sending images to the uh, to the news, uh, to the newspapers, um, 
ironically, we had the best internet on the whole island, I think, because there was a cell tower just next to the house. Um, so that was kind of lucky. Um, that didn't last the whole time, though. No, that actually, we, the, the lava actually cut off uh, some of that uh, in the end. And that's one of the reasons I had to evacuate. Um, but um, so, yeah, so that's uh, that's how my first uh, three weeks sort of went. Kind of a complete blur, but absolutely spectacular. And then later on, I, I managed to get into the air. You know, as a former pilot, of course, I had to get into the air and get the aerial shots. Um, this sort of this sort of image from from the light aircraft I was in kind of shows you the extent of the eruption. Now, that's a nine mile long river going from one of the big fissures here all the way around here into the ocean. And everything inside this ring of fire was basically dead or destroyed uh, by lava in some form. And here are some statistics about the eruption that will really make you think. Um, 700 homes were destroyed, uh, more than 700. Uh, 9,000 acres of land were covered in lava. Um, in some places, it's 200 feet thick. Um, you know, I remember, I remember, you know, parts of the land that I saw before the lava reached it, and I could, for example, see a sea view. And then several days later, there was so much lava that poured in over the space in between that it actually blocked the view. Um, so for all the destruction, you know, 800 acres of new land and some fine black sand beaches were formed in real time while I was there. It was amazing. Um, as I, I mentioned, there's a nine mile long lava river that went to the ocean. This is part of it here in the bottom picture. Um, you can see how close it got to some of the homes that were spared. Um, in terms of volume, they say 325,000 Olympic swimming pools of lava came out of Fisher 8. Um, mind blowing numbers, really. Uh, they say it was one cubic kilometer. I can't even imagine what one cubic kilometer looks like. Um, and then Fisher 17, which was in front of the house that I was staying in, hurled lava bombs 1,200 feet into the air. And we know this because helicopters came in and they were they were sort of trying to assess what was going on with it and they actually found that uh, some of the lava was coming up like above them and they were at 1,200 feet. So they had to climb higher to make sure they were safe. Um, I cannot overstate the violence and the ferocity. It was literally breathtaking. So again, you know, it's this is not for the faint-hearted. You know, volcano photography really isn't for the faint-hearted. You've really got to be careful and you've got to assess your risk. Um, so here's an example. I was photographing uh, a surface breakout of the lava. And um, so in this situation, it gets very hot. You know, the temperature rises really fast when you get closer to the lava. Um, and so when you're taking pictures and it's dynamically moving, you have to kind of keep adjusting your composition. But you basically have to put your camera on and down on a tripod, set it up as quick as you can, and then step away and use like a remote release or cable release uh, to, to trigger the camera. And then go back in, check your shots, make any adjustments, come back. So I'd, I'd taken this shot, which was fine. And then, uh, then I went back in and I was looking at other shots on my camera and they started to blur and I didn't quite understand why. And then suddenly I realized, oh my goodness, uh, the ground underneath my tripod was melting and it was moving the camera. So I realized this and grabbed my tripod as quick as possible, pulled away um, to safety. And as you can see from this image on the right, uh, it sort of burned the rubber on the soles of my, uh, of my feet of my tripod. And it also actually removed the rubber soles on my hiking boots. So they melted. Um, but luckily, you know, one of the things I planned for was exactly this particular problem. And I had shoe glue in my camera bag and I had duct tape. And um, when things cooled down, I was able to put my shoe back together and uh, wrap it up. And I was able to hike away from this because um, you don't really want to be walking on that. Uh, even the cooled lava is quite sort of a bit sharp and, you know, kind of irregular. And it's quite difficult to walk on. So you don't really want to, you want to have decent shoes when you walk on these things. And some other very real risks, uh, you know, toxic fumes in the air. You know, this is standard, standard attire. You know, this is what you have to wear. You have to wear gas masks that have uh, sulfur dioxide uh, filters in them. Um, sulfur dioxide is uh, particularly bad to ingest because it interacts with the water in your eyes and in your throat um, and uh, creates sulfuric acid. Um, so you don't want that. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, helmet for um, lava bombs basically flying through the air. Um, another interesting thing is uh, you get ash fall out and you get this thing called Pele's hair, uh, which looks like uh, in long form, it's kind of looks like human hair strands or horse hair strands, um, but it's actually a sort of volcanic ash fiberglass like material. And it can be very fine as well. It's quite tensile strong, so you can actually pull it and it doesn't break, um, but you can sort of break it that way. And, um, and it can also come in small pieces, not just long pieces. And you don't want to breathe that in. It's actually quite dangerous um, for your lungs. And then you know, here's an example of a, of a flying bit of molten 
uh, lava that's gone through the air and uh, pierced a tree and you can see the scorch mark here at the top and then it slid down and cooled and rested in place there and um, yeah so that's sort of you know projectiles flying through the air you want to be careful of um, and like I said anything sort of anywhere near the lava kind of gets um, just killed basically. So those are all like the spectacular you know things about the eruption but you know everyone was photographing and filming you know the, the lava and I realized there were these human stories that needed to, to be told because you know all these homes are being lost I mean this is a housing estate here and here this fissure that erupted in the middle of a housing estate fissure eight basically there were there were homes here and they were completely buried in lava and people lost everything they lost all their worldly possessions and here you know big chunks of road were just isolated uh, sort of destroyed and then just little little slivers left these are called kipukas which is a, like an island surrounded by lava so <clears throat> i really got to thinking well i really need to tell the human stories and this is where the empathy and ethics comes in because i you know i i was i was very you know sensitive and compassionate you know i could see these people were hurting um you know, so some people had lost everything um and this is an example so this 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 man down here he's got a step ladder and he'd gone and hiked over the cool lava um, to see what he could find that remained of his home and this was all that was left um, his, his house is buried under here somewhere and this albizia tree which is a huge tree um, basically was all that was left and it was a tree house in his garden um, so what happened was the uh, the uh, the trunk of the tree had uh, got incinerated the rest of the tree that was above the lava basically then fell in a fan like shape around it and i went overhead and he actually took the step ladder and he put it down in the hole where the tree trunk used to be to see what he could find at the bottom. And all he found was a rusty nail. This was about, actually, this was quite, this was quite a thin layer of lava. It was only about uh, 12 feet thick, we think, um, considering some parts like up here were around 200 feet thick. I mean, it's just incredible um, and really sad, actually. So by kind of uh, being more empathetic and compassionate to the local people, um, and respectful of Hawaiian culture as well, <clears throat> excuse me, which is very important over there. You know, they really take their, um, their religion and their culture very seriously. Um, and so I was respectful of that. And, you know, I got to, I got to meet people and win their trust, basically. And they got to see me not as just a photojournalist who wanted sensational stories, but actually cared about, um, you know, their situation and their stories. And I, and I wanted to tell their stories uh, with some sort of empathy. So this kind of, uh, I think it warned me to them and it helped me um, sort of make friends and win their trust. And uh, this sort of helped me actually tell um, more interesting stories uh, than just uh, stories about the lava, because it wasn't just, uh, you know, about that. It was also about humans and the animals, actually. So, you know, this is a point where you decide as a photojournalist, you're going to make a decision. Um, you know, at what point do I stop taking photos, right? Or stop taking video? Um, now, here, obviously, I had my camera. What I found was I was putting my camera down a lot and helping out uh, where I could. Um, you know, while telling the stories. And of course, in all of these cases, all of these images here, they knew I was taking photos and they were okay with it because I'd won their trust and they knew, um, they knew I was there to help as well. So, you know, in the top left corner, I'm helping this, uh, this gentleman uh, evacuate belongings from his, uh, his mother-in-law's house that was about to get hit by lava. This uh, area here is literally on the edge of her property. And luckily for her, it stopped uh, right, right there. Um, then here in this image, I was. Uh, this was the day we all had to evacuate because uh, the lava was going to cut off our escape route, the final escape route, and the lava was going to cut it off. So we had to get out of there really quickly. So I was helping uh, this man here um, uh, take out some belongings. And then here, this was actually several months later when I went back in the uh, for the aftermath of the eruption. And uh, some of these uh, these homeowners who didn't have their houses destroyed but were blocked off by the lava decided they want to go back in and try and rebuild. And at that point, the county hadn't, uh, they hadn't bulldozed any of the, uh, any new roads over the, over the lava, <coughs> excuse me. So access was, uh, was only by um, either a very arduous hike or by helicopter. So they hired helicopters and I joined them on some of these missions uh, to fly in and drop in their, uh, their supplies here. Now, as I say, it wasn't just about human stories. There were there were some quite sad animal stories as well. Um, hundreds of turtles, sea turtles, uh, were killed in the eruption, um, very sadly, and that could have been avoided. But uh, unfortunately, the local authorities didn't do a very good job in that respect, and 
uh, volunteers were kind of powerless to do anything about it. But this was one that I managed to um, to take um, that did survive. And he was far away from the lava, thankfully. And these are two uh, animals that I was directly involved in uh, their care and rescue. Um, the one on the left, Ginger, the lava cat, um, as I call her, she um, she was uh, she was found in an abandoned house just before I evacuated. And that uh, that there is the lava that's uh, moving towards the final escape route that I was road that I was talking about. And I had to get out there as quick, out of there as quick as possible. But I took that photo and I uh, and I managed to get it to the volunteer groups that were involved in animal rescue, and they were able to come back and get her. So she was rescued. <clears throat> and then this, this horse was called uh, Koa, Koa the lava horse, as I called him. And he came to the house where I was staying. And sometimes I was alone in the house. Uh, there was absolutely nobody there for many days. And he just turned up one day. And uh, he looked injured and, and, uh, and malnourished and in pain and obviously looking for help. And um, so I, I found some food and, and, and water for him and, and looked after him. He kept coming back to the house. Uh, he was like a companion. Uh, for me for quite a while as I was alone there for, for a while um, and he was eventually I managed to, to sort of find out uh, find out what to do with him and there was uh, somebody prepared to look after him so he was rescued and he made a full recovery they were going to put him down but uh, but uh, the locals insisted that they would try and save his life and uh, they did and uh, when I went back several months uh, later I was reunited with him which was a really nice moment I think he definitely remembered me um, and then other stories that I did. So even even this, I, I, I mentioned this guy. We called him Puna Puff, um, and uh, so he was uh, he was a, a toy dragon that I found on the edge of a lava flow, right on the edge. And he was in a dead bush that obviously got partly incinerated by the lava. And he was inside it. I saw it and I pulled him out. And he actually has got a scorch mark on his uh, on his foot here and on his hand. So he just survived. Um, I never found out who owned him. I sort of tried to find out. Nobody claimed him. Um, but when I sort of posted stories, you know, like this about about him and and you know the the, the rescue animals and the people stories, um, it kind of helped people with their healing, you know. Uh, and so uh, so that kind of I think you know helped again with sort of winning the trust of the locals uh, um, over there. And um, one day I had a surprise while I was there. Um, uh, the Royal Order of Kamehameha. Um, which is a religious order that tries to uh, promote and protect uh, traditions uh, and Hawaii culture um, and promote aloha spirit, you know, this warm and welcoming uh, vibe that, that you get from being in Hawaii. It's a wonderful thing. Um, so, um, you know, they kind of got to know me uh, from my work out there and they invited me to be their official photographer for the King Kamehameha Day celebration, which was a huge honor. I mean, as a foreigner, I think it was unprecedented to be asked. Um, to, to, to photograph such an important uh, event. And I jumped at the chance. And uh, these are some photos from that day. It was a beautiful day, I'll never forget it. And um, but remember, this is all in the context of an eruption going on in the background, right? So, uh, so you know, the Hawaiian culture takes a very different approach to maybe, uh, you know, other people um, to, to the sense of loss um, and damage. And um, uh, because they kind of, you know, they, they see it as well, if the, if the volcano is gonna take away their worldly possessions, then they'll be sad for a little bit, but they'll just move on and say, okay, fine, we'll just, we'll accept it and, and we'll move on. Um, and uh, this uh, this lady here at the bottom, she's amazing. Her name was Wonder Woman. She introduced herself to me in the car park before the event as Wonder Woman. Um, and she was just like a car park attendant. Uh, but later on, I discovered she's one of the most well-known Hawaiian dancers, hula dancers. Um, so that was pretty cool. Beautiful dancer, by the way, that was amazing. So what did I you know, learn from this experience in Hawaii? Um, that by taking the time, I was able to go really deep on my stories. So if you have time, uh, when you're telling your uh, stories in film, it, it'll lead on photographs, it leads to a much richer understanding of your subject matter. And uh, ultimately you'll tell better stories, okay? So, um, you know, the thing was, uh, you know, I learned that being sensitive to situations, people, animals, and the environment uh, was important you know, and respectful of culture. Um, so of course I took my camera everywhere but I found I wasn't always using it. Uh, and I was asking myself, you know, should I even take pictures or video? So this really kind of formed my approach um, to this particular uh, assignment. I didn't focus too much on the sensationalized kind of um, uh, photography stories. Um,
can make some enemies of you, but uh, you, you know, it also made me a lot of friends and those open doors. So with that in mind, you know, uh, when I made a film about the uh, volcanic eruption, there were lots of different ways I could have made it. Um, because of what I've just said, you know, because I knew what my target audience was, they'd be quite sensitive to the contents of my film. There's a lot of things I didn't put in my film, uh, a lot of things I left out. Um, and I focused kind of mainly on the lava story, um, but what's still sort of indicating, you know, you know that there was some impact and damage um, you know, to human lives. Uh, but thankfully, nobody was killed. So now I'm going to play the film. Uh, it's five minutes long. And, uh, and uh, you'll see also, like I've just done it without narration, it's just to music. So again, this might help you hopefully with your submissions when you're trying to uh, fit your footage to music. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay. Did you enjoy that? That's incredible. So, uh, yeah, even, you know, no matter how many times I watch it, I still kind of have this really visceral reaction, you know, like <laughs> it has such impact on you when you're there, but even, you know, years later and, and, you know, you know, local friends are still healing actually, you know, three years later, they see any, any bit of footage like, like this. This is why I had to be sort of careful with my edit because it, it evokes such an emotional response in people, even today, three years later. Yeah. Um, I mean, so, um, so I mentioned, sorry, yes, you were going to say something? seeing it on the small screen i mean you could sort of sense it you know that flower of nature but mm. i bet i mean if you're seeing in the large screen or you're in real life and feeling the temperature i mean that it's probably yeah incredible. and the sounds there those are the uh real sounds that are recorded from the field and now obviously to play them on a on a film they need to be like comfortably audible but in real life they're actually deafening wow um, and i can't i actually think i did damage my hearing you know even though i had some earplugs it's actually some of the explosions were so violent i can't it literally took my breath away and they'd be like a shock wave so you'd get this um you know the house was shaking anyway um, from the earthquakes but sometimes well actually not sometimes almost all the time the fisher 17 um was so explosive that you'd see you'd see the action and then like half a second later the shock wave would hit the house um yeah so literally like a bomb wow. um, you know and actually it broke some windows it, it didn't break windows in in the house i was in but it mm. broke uh, it broke some windows in a house just a little bit further down yeah. Um, yeah yeah this is you know this is mother nature at her most impressively violent and breathtaking <laughs> you know, it really makes you feel like this this big you know yeah, well, we got to learn to respect nature. Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, so this is Rusty. Um, you heard his crow there, defiant crow, as we called it. Uh, he became an internet sensation. He, uh, because we were live streaming sometimes from the from the balcony of the house, and, uh, and you could hear his crow, you know, between the explosions, and that kind of, uh, you know, provided some light relief and hope, if you like. Uh, for, for people watching and for, for local people. So um, we don't know what happened to him. Unfortunately, he didn't get rescued. He belonged to the owners and uh, for whatever reason, they decided not to take him. Um, so we don't know what happened to him, um, but he, uh, he re forever remains in our hearts and minds. Uh, that's why I had to put him in the film, really. He had to be represented in there somewhere, um, I felt. Um, so yeah, um, what was I gonna say? Uh, yeah. yeah. So, so I just want to make a point there. Actually, if you saw in that film, I put a, a put a couple of still photos in there. Actually, um, so when people are making, you know, when the kids are making their submissions, uh, you know, don't think that it all has to be video. They can superimpose some photos, um, but they have to just make it fit the frame because the framing for a uh, for a video is slightly different to the photo frame. Mm -hmm. That's so fine. just like make that <clears throat> just like make that point. Um, yeah uh so yeah any questions about the film i'll just continue with the rest of the talk nearly finished so it's all well and good you know i've taken taken you on these uh, sort of uh, journeys around the world um but really you know i want you all to think about you know telling stories uh, locally okay you know uh, you're all uniquely placed wherever you live whatever town or village town or city you live in uh, you're uniquely placed to tell stories that are local to you yeah. And it's on trend, actually, because we're some of the research that's been done in this is that audiences are actually becoming in, increasingly interested in learning about stories in their communities or in their local area. OK, and there are so many interesting stories to tell in our backyards. So first of all, you know, I'm here in the UK and I've been stuck here for a while uh, and I've just adapted and I've gone out and I found local wildlife uh, stories to tell and photographs and, and video. I've got tons of interesting behavior and footage that I still haven't put into a film, which I'm working on everything from common species like squirrels and pigeons to foxes and bats and swans and all kinds of things. So um, yeah, don't feel that you have to travel to exotic destinations to tell really interesting and relevant uh, wildlife and nature stories. One. And uh, you know, here's an example from Hong Kong. You know, I, I was one day just wandering around the streets of uh, Kennedy Town here where I live with my camera looking for something to photograph. I remember looking down on the pavement and seeing a 
a cluster of bird droppings. And then I thought, oh, that's interesting. And I looked up and sure enough, there was a, a swallow's nest um, above the pavement under the sort of cover of a, of a shop. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. Um, and it turns out in the summer, swallow's nest in Hong Kong. Um, so now we're in May. And actually, if I went, if I was there now, I'd be going back to my neighborhood and checking out what the swallow's nests are doing because they'd be active right now. So this one had six chicks in it, which is amazing. Um, and so, you know, then you start asking questions, right? You start going to shopkeepers and restaurant owners and bar owners and, you know, finding out if they know any more about um, these swallow's nests. And slowly over time, I started to build a picture of all these different nests that were all around the neighborhood. And uh, so I started doing a swallow's nest story and that was just in my, in my local neighborhood. And here, you know, I come back to the point about making friends. You know, there was a sandwich shop owner. Um, so actually it's the same, uh, same place I saw this nest and I went into the shop and I bought sandwiches and I made friends with the shop owner and he said, oh, he knew what I was doing, right? He knew I was interested in, in telling a wildlife story in the city. So he said, oh, come into my office uh, upstairs and you can look through the window and you can see the bird's nest uh, in the context of the urban environment. So here's the bird's nest up here, looking, looking out of the window. This is a Hong Kong tram going along the road and then behind it is the restaurant. Uh, so this was just a, a rather different uh, perspective I managed to get just by um, you know, making friends and asking questions. And here's another one. This is in the current, uh, this is actually in my, my Po Nature Reserve Hong Kong, part of a project I've been doing with WWF to tell the story of my Po Nature Reserve. Uh, and it's a, a refuge for, uh, for migratory and wetland birds, uh, some critically endangered, like the black faced spoonbill. And um, it's on the border between Hong Kong and uh, Shenzhen here. This is mainland China. Um, and this image is in the current Wildlife Photographer of the Year exhibition, which is touring globally. So if it comes to a city near you, you can go and see it. Um, and then just to end really, you know, I've talked to, we've talked about wildlife and we have talked about people. Don't forget the people. Um, you know, there are heroes in conservation. These are my heroes in conservation. These are rangers, men and men and women rangers in Uganda. Part of a story I've been doing in Uganda that's, uh, that's uh, still ongoing actually. Um, so, um, you know, they're my heroes on the front line of conservation, you know, risking their lives every day to protect our wildlife. And they have my utmost respect. Um, you know, and, and don't just tell negative impact stories. It's important to tell positive impact stories as well. And, uh, you know, this can show audiences that we can actually make a difference, especially if you can present not only the problem, but the solution. So to summarize, um, you know, when you're making your films, you know, I suggest you seek feedback and discover what works and why. You know, once you, once you understand what's moving an audience, then you can really start to make uh, uh, much more compelling films. Um, I definitely recommend that you all watch lots of nature documentaries um, because they use the three act storytelling stru structure. So study their storytelling structure and sequences and you'll start to see how they uh, build sequences and it's repeatable and consistent. And this will help you, uh, this will help you make better films. Um, uh, you know, don't always use your camera, spend time studying and observing the animal behavior first and their surroundings, you know. Uh, this also puts the odds in your favor of, uh, of getting more interesting footage. And then, you know, have a framework um, and a storyline in mind, but be adaptable and willing to change it. Because at the end of the day, if you're, if you're dealing with what truly wildlife, um, you know, they're not going to always do the things that you want them to do, obviously. And uh, you have to be able to adapt your story and, and change it. And sometimes you get better stories out of it. You get, you know, you see surprising things that you might not have, uh, have thought you'd get otherwise. Um, so obviously, you know, go out there and explore, but explore safely. It's very important that safety comes first. You know, I was, you know, I've done all of these, you know, what seems like potentially risky things, but I've done a lot of careful risk assessment of my own and I'm weighing up my, you know, risks all the time. Um, so, uh, you know, move around, uh, you know, to create your different shots, you know, get low, get high, you know, you can shoot with, you know, anything. Your GoPros are taking, you know, good images, you know, obviously digital cameras with zoom lenses, um, you know, and you can use, you know, your phone. Um, just if you haven't got a zoom, you just have to move your feet, you know, get, get closer. But if you are going to get closer, always be respectful to nature. You know, if you're trying to change your shot sizes, that's one thing, you know, but always be, you know, do it from a respectful distance wherever possible uh, and try not to uh, stress out any wildlife. That's really important. You know, don't just, don't just, uh, you know, go in and, and just trying to get the shot. Just think about, you know, um, the impact that you're having. Um, and then ask questions, you know, scientists, researchers, they're all sort of the important people in conservation to talk to. Um, so be curious, be mindful and present of your surroundings. Um, and you'll find more interesting stories around every corner. 
And ultimately, if you love what you do, the chances are that'll be conveyed to the audience. So above all, enjoy the process. Uh, and a, a final reminder, please, please, please don't forget to back up your precious footage. Um, I recommend having at least one copy and ideally two, so three versions of your, of your footage and photos uh, in separate locations. Because the last thing you want to do is to, is to lose it and not have a, not have a backup. And um, I think there was something you wanted me to say uh, about, um, about the, uh, the, the challenge, uh, Yingying? Yin? Um, no, I think that's good. Everybody knows already. And Chloe okay. has um, put in the chat of the link to our online challenge. I mm -hmm. think, um, yeah, I hope after you heard what Joseph had shared with you, it would be, you will be inspired to really try to take more photographs and especially make of a, you know, a video, a film, uh, even using your phone camera, you can do something in your backyard. Um, don't have to go very far, right? But think about all the wonderful footages that and tips that Joseph has shared with you, especially on how do you tell a story, compelling story, right? So there's, it's absolutely wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Joseph. It's, you know, this is so impressive. And I've learned so much. <laughs> and uh, if you want to get in touch with Joseph, here's his um, various social media and his um, website and take a photo, get in touch with him, follow him on social media. He continues to do incredible wildlife and nature work, uh, both in, in uh, photographing and photography and also videography. So please, please uh, follow him and also, um, Think about the, your. Don't forget to follow Puna Puff, our little dragon friend. Here. Yeah. Think about your own submission, and um, and Joseph is uh, on the panel judges, so he's very much looking forward to, look, you know, review all of your submission. So. I am very looking forward to it, and um, you, so you know, I make I make books and prints, and uh, I actually got a book that I made about my Nikon film actually. There as well so there's the photo story that goes with the, the film um uh in, in there as well um but thank you so much uh ying ying and chloe and uh i hope everyone enjoyed the the talk i'll take any questions now thank you joseph um if you have any questions uh, please feel free to unmute yourself or type it in the text box and we'll get back to you um at the meantime i just want to remind you that our last workshop will be next saturday at 4 p.m hosted by hong kong based singer songwriter um, as well as a uh, uh, music healing practitioner so if you want to join our voices for the planet challenge in the music um, area please join us or if not share with your friends your school your parents and we hope to see you very soon okay okay so yes I mean, obviously, the filming the volcano is just the incredible ah. experience in life as a human human being, right? Um, any any very sort of just the poignant moment in when you are filming a wildlife as a photographer. Sorry, say that again. If that so for the special moment, you know, while you were filming um, a wildlife? Oh, gosh, so many. <laughs> Would you share um, with our audience? I think, you know, one shot I didn't, I didn't show as an outtake shot. Um, when I was filming with the elephants, remember I said that uh, it's a very special moment if the elephant family presents a youngster to you because it shows that you kind of um, earn their trust. So that that did happen on two occasions, um, and it's a very special, you know, it's a very distinct act on their part, right? You can see, you can see they've thought about it, and they're going, okay, we're gonna let we're gonna let the youngster see you up close now. We kind of we trust that you're not gonna do anything to hurt us. Wow. So I'd say I'd say that one was a pretty special moment, and to have it happen twice on the same on the same assignment trip was 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 yeah 
you know, I felt really touched by that. You just kind of know. And also I'd say, you know, my experience with that horse in Hawaii was pretty special. You know, that horse is, unfortunately he passed away recently. Oh, but he had a, you know, he was, he was quite old and, and, you know, they were going to put him down originally from his injuries. He had an abscess in his hoof, it turned out, and uh, the vet wanted to put him down and um, hadn't been treated for years. He'd been walking around on that abscess for years in agony and they'd, uh, they'd not done anything for him. And um, they said the vet was going to put him down, but luckily the volunteers uh, managed to raise some funds and, you know, we managed to raise some money for him and, and uh, help with his upkeep. And he, he made a great recovery. When I went back to see him, he was such a happy horse. It was such a difference, right? And to have the reunion with him. And I, I you know, you talk about sentience and that horse knew he remembered me. You know, obviously I remembered him, but as soon as I, as soon as I turned up and he saw me, he was like, you know, you could just he changed. He was, he was like really excited and happy. And he came up to me and it was like old yeah. friends, you know? You know so those one, were two kind of real connection with nature moments that stick in my mind. Oh. So one of the things that I hear what you said in today, it, there's a lot of compassion and empathy, uh, both for nature, for wildlife, and also for humans, yeah, that are mm. involved. And which is really very, um, to me, that's very special of your talk. Um, and, and then also says a lot about you as a, a human being and also as a, an amazing uh, artist. So very thoughtful, mindful, and compassionate. Mm -hmm. And I think that is something I think we can all think about as we go through life. So thank you so much, Joseph. Yeah, I think yeah, it's my pleasure. Um, you know, on that, I just think, you know, there's a, there's a temptation in this day and age with demand for attention in the media world, right, to do anything for a shot, yeah. right? And I don't believe in that, right? Yeah. I, don't think, I don't think some situations are important enough to do that, right? So some of, there's some stories in Hawaii that I shot and then never published, okay? And that was a very conscious decision, partly in discussion with the people who they were about. And they were on board with it actually to begin with, which is why I proceeded, right? Because I had their approval. But then for their own reasons, you know, they they were still suffering from the effects of of the eruption on, on them and their property and their life. And you know, they didn't know what their reaction was going to be. But when they saw my images afterwards, so I mean I was taking all these pictures. And they didn't see them, obviously, because I was too busy taking them. Then when I put them together as a story, they had obviously such huge impact on them that when they saw them, their reaction was unexpected to themselves. They didn't expect it. And they sort of decided against, you know, me publishing them. And I was literally at the point of sending those pictures off to the media, like literally just about to hit send. And, and I just said, no, okay, look, we're gonna, we're not gonna do this. So, you know, and that was, you know, when it, that story, if it ever gets published, I mean, it's pretty crazy what happened to their house, you know, um, the images I got, even I, mean, I look at them, I just like, oh my God, I just can't believe this. You know, that would have been a pretty sensational story to publish, right? Would have got a lot of press attention, but it just wasn't worth it, right? Yeah. Well, and so that's the point. You just have to know where to draw the line, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, on that note, I will say Thank you so much, Joseph. That's just truly inspiring and, you know, very compassionate and mindful um, story that you've told both as an artist and as a human being. So you have my respect and <laughs> really fantastic and just loved your photographs. So I hope a lot of our students and in schools will be watching this, um, this, this um, uh, recording and we will also you know put it on there and put different language tabs and people can you know then tap into that to watch it yeah. i hope a lot of uh, want to be photographers and filmmakers will be inspired by your story thank you so well, much so. we need we need an army of them really to start you just keep telling these stories because it's important you know um, get the messages out you know the the, the there can't be too much of it, I don't think, actually, because there's so many stories to tell. There's so many issues around the world that need addressing. And, uh, and so I don't think we've got you know, enough for all the photographers and videographers that are out there. 
it's, I think, you know, we still need, we still need more. So in the younger generation, they come up with great ideas, you know, and they're moving with the times. And, and so, yeah, they're playing a very important part in, in the future of, uh, of our planet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And All thank right. everybody. Thank you, Constantine and Neil. I think thank you uh, for joining.